Hello, welcome to Finding the Voices. Good morning, good afternoon, good day uh, from wherever you guys are watching us from. So today we are here um, to feature people of Manipur uh, and I have a very, very special guest and I've been really looking forward for this uh, uh, session uh, because there are a lot of interesting topics. Um, so we have in our set Professor Azailu Numei, uh, who is joining us from Hyderabad. And, you know, I have spoken with her a little bit uh, before, and I know that she has a lot of, done a lot of interesting work. Um, specifically, I am looking forward to learning about child trafficking and a lot more. So Azailu is a professor of sociology and head of Center for the Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusion Policy at the University of Hyderabad. She has served as the Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology in uh, University of Ohio too. Uh, and she is one of the pioneer in establishing the Center for Women's Study, right? Uh, so I have a lot of questions for her uh, on her study and um, she belongs to the Langmai tribe, Naga, Naga tribe from Tamai. Um, and her specialization also includes sociology of gender, Indian diaspora, Northeast studies, NGOs, and development. So with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Azailui in our set. Hello, welcome. Hi, <laughs> Monica. Good morning there in the US and good evening here in India. <laughs> yeah, you're looking so beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> you want to share about what you're wearing to us? Uh, yeah, so beautiful. A shawl gifted by one of my friends, Si Wang Liu. And this is uh, uh, called uh, Ngum Pai in Liang Mai Naga dialect. So it's hand woven. You can see the traditional weavers uh, from uh, Tamenglong district. Uh, yeah, yeah. This and they it's mark so it they all over the places, including overseas. So this is yeah. one of my traditional Liang Mai Naga shawl. <laughs> and I am glad to wear this on your show, Monica. Yeah, I'm so happy. Okay, so I have just zoomed you out and I know you showed the design. Can you show it again? Yeah, okay. Here it is. Yeah, this that's is so a, beautiful. A handmade design and these are also made by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see on the other end, I think uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. So both men and women is gender neutral both men and women wear this okay. shawl. So, you know, it's very interesting for a gender expert to see that some of the dresses are unisex. Uh, there is no demarcation between men and women, but it's woven, it's it's worn by both uh, the gender. So. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a good way to start our show, uh, learning. Uh, and seeing the beautiful product, um, you know, of Manipur. Uh, and, you know, as we see that we have different designs for different tribe, and this is one of them, and it's beautiful. Welcome yeah. to our show. And I know that you do a lot of, lot of interesting work, but we want to hear from you if you can give us uh, an introduction about yourself. And I'm particularly interested about your background, about where you were born, growing up. And, you know, let's start with that. Yeah, okay. Thank you for having me in your show, Monica. And I've been a great fan of yours and often watch your show. So it's a privilege for me to be with you today in this show online. Um, I uh, was born and brought up in Tamai, in Tamanglong district, studied in Tiny Todd Unique School in Imphal, later on shift for high school in Manipur Public School. And then I did my graduation in sociology honors from Miranda House, Delhi University, which is considered as number one ladies college uh, in the country today the recent news yeah uh, 
I, I yeah. heard that. Very excited about that. I because know all the Mirandian I, girls are all over the social media saying we are proud to be Mirandians. <laughs> yeah, and my sister uh, Miranda. Is, yeah, her name well, is Miranda. Miranda and sister Miranda. did in Miranda House. So yeah, and and yeah. I used to go for vacation and I used to be a paying guest, uh, oh, you know, in in Miranda House. So definitely, I would uh, echo that congratulation and celebration. Yeah, thank you. So I did my MA, MPhil, and PhD from JNU, and my postdoc is from University of Iowa uh, in Midwest near Chicago. And I joined this University of Hyderabad uh, in the year 2000 as one of the youngest faculty right after my MPhil. And uh, I managed to complete my PhD uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, because of my teaching and administrative work, I couldn't devote in writing my thesis, so it took quite a while for me to finish. But anyway, I completed. That's uh, good news. And uh, I, you know, as you introduced me, I have been working um, sincerely on uh, gender issues, uh, particularly on human trafficking. Uh, of children and also girls and women uh, since the past 11 years. And my focus has been on Manipur. And uh, initially, um, uh, I would say that, you know, I uh, never imagined that human trafficking will invade in the state of Manipur and also in other parts of Northeast India. Mm -hmm. um, so um, to go back to the Eureka, Eureka movement of a moment of my research, um, I would uh, go back to 2008. I spent a summer holiday with my younger brother Ningning Ning, uh, in Imphal. And while, um, you know, trying to go back to Hyderabad, both of us, uh, walk into the Imphal airport and a lady called me out who happened to know my name. So when I turned back, she said to me uh, that she uh, needs my help. Mm -hmm. And when I asked her, how can I help you? Uh, she replied that her sister is traveling by aircraft for the first time. And therefore she wants me to uh, intervene and help her. So I said, yes, please describe about her feature. I'll try to track her down. And she did. But when I walk, when I check into the first layer of security with my brother, we look out for that feature of a girl, but we couldn't find, you know? And that's when uh, my brother, uh, he keep insisting me that something is very fishy. Something is absolutely not right. And my conscience is also pricking me at that moment that something is absolutely not right in the Infal airport. And uh, this little brother of mine uh, keep pestering me, you know, I couldn't sit there <laughs> saying, get up and go back to that lady. I said, no, the security, CISF, uh, uh, security guards are very strict. They wouldn't allow us to go outside the airport again. But because of his insistence, I woke up, I uh, stood up and went to the uh, CISF uh, security guard at the entrance of that Infal airport. And I said, Bhaiya, uh, minute ke liye thora permission de do, mein bahar jana hai, mere relatives ko milne ke liye. You know, surprisingly, he said yes. Mm -hmm. so when I went back, the lady was still there with her friend and another man. So I told her, look, your sister is not there. Perhaps she's gone into the second layer of security. Uh, but uh, tell me uh, which aircraft is she flying? Because that, uh, during that time, I flew by Deccan Airways, which is a part of Kingfisher. And no, now uh, there's no more Kingfisher, you know, the infamous Vijay Mala's uh, aircraft, airlines. Uh, and uh, the woman says she's, uh, she took uh, jet airways. So I said, okay, is she going to Hyderabad? She said, no, to Singapore. You know, Monica, at that moment, looking at the woman's feature, it blew my mind away that the girl is flying off to Singapore. So mm -hmm. the next question I ask is, 
is she going to study in Singapore? But in my mind, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking uh, that she doesn't look as if she can afford to study in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Well, the lady said, well, um, pointing at her friends, she said the friend's uh, daughter, her friend's daughter and her younger sister are going to make, work as housemaid in Singapore. Mm -hmm. At that moment, my heart sank. And I thought of all the places in the world, now Manipur is exporting women, exporting girls, young girls, 18 years, 17 years, 15, 16 years old girls abroad. And I just told her, look, I feel something is not so good. If you need any help, contact my parents since you seem to know my family and let me know if I can be of help, you know? And I try to trace her in Calcutta airport because there's a connecting, but the mafia of traffickers are so organized. This is a global mafia we're dealing with. It's not even Manipur uh, traffickers alone, but they're interconnected, you know, transnational uh, global mafia. Um, as soon as I reach uh, Calcutta airport, both me and my brother look around for this girl, we could, which, uh, which occurs to my mind that there is somebody who is already there in the domestic airline, uh, domestic airport in Calcutta. And they have taken her to the international airport. Mm -hmm. See, she and her friend is flying for the first time. But the fact that they can be taken to the international sector reveals that there's somebody who's already waiting there. And it indicates, send across the message, strong message, that this is a mafia, a very well-organized mafia. And so this is the story uh, of how I... I started to uh, do my research because I began to think my conscience was pre and um, I, I couldn't sleep. I keep thinking day after day after day after day. And I, um, you know, began to uh, question uh, what can I do when girls from Manipur are trafficked outside the country? What can I do? I don't have muscle power. I don't have money power. I don't have political power. What power do I have to help our girls? You know, from Tamenglong, from Ukru, from Chandel, from Imphal West, Imphal East, from all over Manipur, or in other parts of Northeast. How, what can I do as an academician? Because I'm not a social activist to go around and, you know, raise my voice in the social platform. Ours is confined to the college or university system. As an academician, I feel the only weapon I have is writing. And to write, I need to conduct my research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I need to have the facts and statistics because I cannot just write like that. So that is the beginning of my journey, Monica. Wow. So that was like a personal encounter which has inspired you and, you know, that yeah. let you uh, take that subject. So when you started the research, can you share a little bit about the outcome and what were the findings? Yeah, uh, just before, uh, you know, um, I share the findings, I also want to add that um, in 2008, October month, you know, so I encountered this uh, incident in June 2008. By October, uh, one morning when I woke up, the newspaper headlines reads uh, that um, uh, I think five Brazilian wrong girls uh, from Manipur are rescued in Kuala Lumpur from a nightclub. Mm -hmm. and it just hit me so hard. And I remember that encounter so clearly in my mind. And um, also, um, the man, I told you this lady, her friend and a man were standing in front of the Imphal airport. The man, uh, you know, folded his hand. He, I still remember vividly that he wore a brown leather jacket. And because it was raining that particular day, it was cloudy and little uh, drizzling a bit. And he asked me, so what do you do in Hyderabad? You know, in the sense I reinterpreted his word as what, what can you do? Even if I'm one of the agent, you know, traffic agent, what can you do to me? You mm -hmm. know, that is the message I got. And I got a feeling of uneasiness, 
discomfort and also a little bit of fear at that moment when the man spoke to me like that. So mm. again, the second thing is in October uh, 2008, when this newspaper flash about this girl who were rescued from Kuala Lumpur nightclub. Um, I call up my folks in Manipur and, um, you know, I said this has happened and it became a bilateral issue between India, um, Malaysia and Singapore. I remember Oscar Fernandez was the minister, minister of uh, external affairs and also the human rights groups and women's group from the Northeast who are based in New Delhi also intervened. And finally, the girls were brought back to Manipur. Now, in the same year, 2008, December, I managed to meet this lady whom I met in June and uh, interviewed her. Uh, and then I applied to UCC after doing a rigorous uh, literature review, a lot of readings of other culture, other countries, and also uh, trafficking in Andhra Pradesh and other parts of India. Uh, I sent uh, my project to proposal to University Grants Commission, UGC, which they funded me uh, for 2012 to 14. Uh, so during that time, uh, so my now I'll come to my findings. Uh, I look at actually three act, uh, three uh, you know uh, actors. One is the police. The second is the NGOs and the social activists. And then the third is the rescued victims. See, it's very difficult for researchers like us, for professors, um, to interview, uh, you know, girls and children who are uh, on the way to their destination, maybe mm -hmm. within India or abroad. Uh, and also it's impossible for us to uh, go to their destination uh, where they are based because it's a mafia control, uh, you know, setup. So what I did is um, I look at, uh, you know, I interviewed those children, girls and women who are already rescued by the uh, Department of uh, uh, Social Welfare and rescued by the police and also by NGOs, some uh, in the hill, uh, you know, children from the hill district, the churches, the youth leaders, and also women's group. For example, Tangkul Sanolong, based in Delhi, women's group, they're very, very active and quite powerful in rescuing children from Manipur. Uh, so um, I uh, managed to get information from these actors. And so the first finding when it comes to police, because I have to look at law and order, um, I found that from 2008, Monica, till uh, around 2011 or early part of 2012, uh, I spoke to three police officers who are IPS. I don't want to name them. Mm -hmm. uh, they clearly told me, look, as I, uh, we have, not arrested anybody we have not rescued anybody you know mm -hmm. uh, and I, to my shock i was totally shocked because in andhra pradesh there's a, a police uh, anti human trafficking unit there's a special cell of the police to deal only with human trafficking of girls and children but in Manipur from 2008 till early part of 2012, we don't have anti human trafficking unit in my findings. Mm -hmm. But by mid 2012, the Manipur police really beat up, they trained, they began to train, and people like Hasina Karbi, who is a founder chairman of Impulse NGO Network. Um, and also many other, uh, you know, um, senior police officers and other noted social activists. Uh, I want to name uh, um, uh, Pradeep Kumar um, and also uh, Montum, uh, Montu Ahantem. Uh, they are doing uh, very good work in terms of um, rescuing the children and uh, also uh, sending them to the shelter homes and many other uh, rehabilitation issues, you know, in terms of, even in terms of policies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, 
So that's that was one major finding which I found, Monica, that the police were not trained uh, till uh, early part of 2012, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that is a great uh, disappointment because from um, uh, 2008, when I began to look into this issue, till 2012, there are hundreds of young children, young boys and girls who were rescued from all over metropolitan cities. I remember from Jaipur, um, you know, this Tanghul Sanolong, the women's uh, Tanghul group from base in Delhi, uh, along with the local youth leaders, church leaders and elders from Ukrul has brought a lot of uh, rescued children back. Uh, and also from Chandel district, from Senapati, from Tamenglong district, even from Nagaland. And of course, even from uh, Taubal, uh, Bishampur, you know, uh, there are a lot of children uh, who were rescued back. Um, so, but then the police were not trained. So that was shocking to me, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that is one point. The second point is that um, NGOs, there are very few NGOs in Manipur during that time who work on human uh, trafficking. Um, only a handful of them uh, were engaged in rescuing the children because it's a new phenomenon, Monica. So the NGOs are not, uh, you know, uh, keen to focus obviously because that's not a social concern prior to that mm -hmm. the NGOs have been focusing on environment forestry uh, or income generation programs you know uh, issues uh, related to climate change uh, issues related to self-help group perhaps um, the issues that matters to the society and trafficking is a new thing uh, so therefore, the NGOs were very few when I did the field work, um, and uh, so that's that's the second point. And then the the, the third uh, issue, the third third uh, finding is that um, again a very shocking thing for me is to find that parents willingly send these children. Mm. And uh, the fourth point I want to say is the traffickers are not foreign people, are not the mainstream Indians, but the trafficking agents are local people. Mm -hmm. For example, in Ukrul is a Tanghul, uh, you know, local agent. From Tamenglong district, it's again the, uh, uh, the Zaliangrong, uh, you know, the, the Rongmai, Zemai, or the Lengmai, you know, the uh, uh, Sub tribes there now. Each of the tribes have their own uh, uh, languages. So they uh, the the traffickers employ the local agents in Sanapati. They again do the same. You know, uh, they will hire the, their own locals. So is in Churachandpur, very notorious in Churachandpur. Uh, I mean, the number of traffic victims are huge in Churachandpur in Manipur. So mm -hmm. again, in Churachandpur is the local agent who would convince the parents. And the parents, you know, most of them, uh, be it be Bishampur or be it be uh, Manipur, Imphal West, Imphal East or the Hill District, uh, most of the parents are, I, I don't want to use this term, but they're naive. Mm -hmm. the so, trust, trusting parents, I would say. Yeah, so, so what are these people telling that their children are going to do to lure them? Yeah, right. That's a that's a good question, Monica. The the, the local agent would often convince the parents that their kids, their wards will be given free education, mm. boarding with boarding facility, and many times they make this false promise that they will be look their children will be looked after up to class ten or class twelve intermediate, you know. And uh, uh, so we are talking them, about very young children. How old yes, are the children yes. in each group? Oh, uh, uh, as young as five years old, Monica. Oh my God, I am getting the chills when you're saying five year old. Yes, 
as young as five years old. I have pictures which I cannot display in social media yeah. for, uh, you know, the confidential, uh, confidential identity uh, has to be, uh, you know, uh, honored. So I wouldn't uh, want the pictures, but privately I can share one day to you. You will see that uh, they are so, so young. I, as, as I said, uh, yeah, and, and you know, like years, Manipur, yeah, Manipur, like the parents, we have that value system of education. So when you hear that, oh my God, like you are, the child is going to be educated in some good place, even in yeah. the foreign destination, they are willing to send without like much background check or knowing where exactly they are going. Yeah, that's also Monica. Uh, that's that's also possible because the local people, as I said earlier, in Ukrul, the Ukrul uh, local person is the trafficking agent. Mm -hmm. So is in other district. So obviously, when the local uh, local agent is a known person from their own village or from their own home uh, home uh, town, you know, uh, who speaks their own dialect. Right. Um, parents uh, tend to trust them. And also another uh, interesting thing is that some of the pseudo theologians who are not, I do not want to criticize mm. anybody here, but these are facts which is already known. It's a, it's a open secret to many people who work in the field of trafficking that some of the pseudo theologians also have misused um, uh, you know their um, uh, what do you say their degree mm -hmm. by telling this village uh, parents that look i'm a theologian trained in so and so college and i'm taking your kids to bangalore or to pune or to goa or to hyderabad or to calcutta you know or to chennai because these are the major cities where a lot of children were trafficked from Manipur and they were rescued back, of course, many of them. Uh, I don't know how many people are still there in their destinations now because there is no statistics. Uh, complete 100% uh, accurate statistics is not available in Manipur. So uh, I have to depend on the field work. Mm -hmm. You know, the research that I conducted there uh, reveals that uh, thousands, thousands of children have been trafficked and uh, um, not all of them are rescued back till now. Although majority have been rescued, but still there are some, uh, even abroad, you know, regarding this uh, uh, girls who were rescued from Malaysia, Kuala, Kuala Lumpur, uh, they revealed that uh, in 2008, 2008 and nine, they revealed that around 150 girls are still there in Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, but they cannot think of returning back because they are, uh, the traffickers seize their passport. Mm -hmm. So without passports, it's impossible for them to come back, right? Right. So the point I'm making here is that parents are very trusting. Right, right. And also the, tra the traffickers are very, very strategic because they hire the local person who speaks the dialect of that particular village or community. Got it. And another factor, Monica, uh, which I want to point out is that schools in Manipur are in a pathetic condition earlier. I'm sure things are improving today, but in 2008, 9, 10, you know that Many of these public schools, private schools, are very expensive for poor parents. And the government schools are not functioning well. So when somebody offers that in Bangalore or in Pune or in Chennai, free education with boarding facility will be provided till the child completes class 10 or class 12, obviously the parents tend to uh, believe these uh, local agents. Mm -hmm. So from your uh, field work, where are these children ending up? I think the scenario for, you know, children being trafficked within India, where are they ending up? The, uh, I found that um, a group of them, a huge number of them ended up in a shelter home in Pune. 
you know, and also a bunch of them in Kerala, another bunch of them in Chennai and uh, Bangalore, even uh, in Warangal near Hyderabad um, uh, and a uh, few in Delhi. So these are the hot spots where these children were, uh, you know, taken to the destination uh, places. And what are they doing? I mean, what, what are they making the children do? Yeah, so uh, I want to emphasize this particular case in uh, Jaipur. Uh, in Jaipur, uh, uh, you know, dozens of them uh, were kept in the home for a couple of years. And when they rescued, after, after they were rescued, the children narrated to us that um, the girls are not sent to school. Only the boys were sent to school. But the girls were made to do all kinds of work, uh, starting from domestic chores to cleaning. And, you know, they were made to do a lot of other, uh, like uh, any other normal migrant laborers work. Mm -hmm. But uh, the warden of that hostel used to teach uh, the girls in the uh, shelter home. But they were not sent to uh, a formal school. Okay. In Pune, one young girl, I, uh, when she was five years old, um, she was kept in this uh, uh, shelter home in Pune. And in fact, she has forgotten, I think she returned back when she was 11 years old to Manipur. And she forgot how to speak her language, local dialect. Mm -hmm. And this young girl said that she was not sent to school. She was made to... Um, do the, uh, you know, uh, uh, cleaning, cleaning job. Uh, and when she asked whether she will be sent to school, the person concerned said first she has to learn Marathi and English. Then only she will be sent to school. So till 11 years, apparently she was not sent to school. Okay, so mostly they are using in the case, you know, for the very young children in India, they are using them for work yeah for work and for also work. sexual exploitation uh, this uh, shelter home in jaipur uh, the warden uh, he has sexually exploited a lot of these teenage girls and uh, uh, this can be verified by uh, social local social activists in manipur also mm -hmm. and the ones uh, who are trafficked outside right like you mentioned the cases yeah. of kuala lumpur and singapore so they are more yeah. for sexual exploitation yeah yeah in the name of domestic uh, work they have been uh, traffic and when i interviewed the parents uh, the par the families mentioned that uh, initially the local agents promised them a salary of 20000 to the girls per month and the girls are supposed to uh, send the remittances uh, back home to their families but once they reach their destinations um, there is no question of sending the remittances. And uh, secondly, uh, I also learned that uh, some of these girls are taught uh, basic etiquette of how to speak English to foreign clients, uh, even to use uh, spoon, fork, the cutlery, you know, to take, suppose the clients take them to a restaurant or a big hotel, uh, the, the girls should know the etiquette, right? So they were taught uh, those basic etiquettes of how to use fork, spoon, knife, and also the basic English courtesy, you know, the pleasantries mm -hmm. to be exchanged between the client and themselves. And once they're trained, then they send them to massage parlor, they send them to nightclubs, and they send to many other um, sectors. Got it, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think people have read about it in the paper, but this is the yes. first time I'm hearing, you know, someone who has worked very closely. So thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for, uh, you know, being inspired by one event, which led to you taking it up as a research project, because I think many of us need to be aware, right, about this. So what yes. is your message to the people of Manipur, particularly to the parents? I. Oh, I would send across a message that they shouldn't send their children just like that. They should cross-check yeah. a dozen times 
before sending out the, the background of the institution, the background of the people, suppose the principal of a school, you know, or the warden of the hostel, they should cross check and speak to them first. And also contact uh, leaders of Northeast, uh, contact uh, their own, uh, you know, uh, student student union leaders as well before sending out through uh, this kind of bogus uh, agents uh, to uh, avail education see basically the pay i don't uh, i can't uh, blame the parents completely because the parents have a good vision for their children what they want is better life you know, right. for the children better education better life so that the children will not suffer like them so the parents have a good vision for their children, but they're naive. They don't investigate the background before sending the children out of the state. So my message to them is be careful. Please cross check the background of the institution. Please cross check the, uh, the, the personality, for example, the, the warden of the hostel or the principal of the school uh, before sending out and talk to people, talk to the leaders before sending out. Right, right. Thank you for that message. And thank you, everyone, for watching. I also see a lot of comments. Keep your comments uh, coming in. Uh, you know, we will definitely pick it up soon. Uh, share your thoughts. I think we are, you know, really talking about very important topic here. Uh, so before we pick up uh, the comments, another item. Is there anything else you want to talk about the trafficking before we move on? Yeah. Yeah, Monica, I am very grateful to all the police officials. Uh, and I must confess that one of the sub inspector, Keda, Yumnam Keda, he has been very, very bold uh, in uh, sharing a lot of information to me. And I'm extremely grateful to him and also Kesam Pradeep Kumar and uh, Montu Ahantem. These are people who really, really helped me in getting the information from the grassroots level. Um, and uh, I even thank the chief minister, uh, Sri Biren uh, Singh. I met him uh, with my friend, childhood friend Romita Athokpam, uh, Dr. Kisan's wife. Um, uh, so the ch I, I urged the chief minister of Manipur in 2007 to form a committee on human trafficking and uh, take up this issue at the pol policy level seriously so that Manipur will stop being a source uh, and transit for trafficking because in 2019, Monica, there were 179 Nepali nationals who were trafficked to other parts who are on the verge of being trafficked overseas via Mani Imphal and More. Mm. Uh, so, you know, Manipur has become a source and a transit for international trafficking. Uh, so I oversee that much earlier, and uh, when I met the ch uh, Honorable Chief Minister, I urged him in his office uh, that um, it will be nice if he can form a committee and if he can take it up at the policy level to curb this human trafficking activity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And of course, you know, you have mentioned all the people behind the scene who are doing the work, right, who are fighting for this cause. All right. So, um, you know, the conversation is very, very interesting. But, you know, I just am looking at the time and we are on already at 38 minutes. Uh, and I do want to cover some more uh, topic of your work. Um, I have read that, um, you know, you do a lot of work to encourage right women to involve in decision making, uh, particularly, you know, when you look at the gender. Uh, and also you conduct workshop in college and university. And I wanted to uh, ask you to talk a little bit on that. Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about my work on, uh, you know, women's issues again. Um, I have been a part of UCC capacity building of women managers in higher education for 10 years now. And um, under that uh, scheme of University Grants Commission, uh, I have conducted um, several workshops to train uh, professors who are in colleges and universities uh, to, to uh, focus on uh, you know, gender issues and also um, 
to sensitize you know because even in uh, educated uh, educational institutions like colleges and university uh, men most of the men are not sensitized monica in india particularly i can't talk about other countries but i can confidently say that in india um, you know a lot of uh, gender sensitization is required uh, not only among the teaching faculty but also among the non teaching faculty right now i'm uh, a member of this uh, sexual harassment committee earlier it's called uh, gss but now uh, we call uh, internal complaints committee icc every university and colleges in india across india have this icc to look into sexual harassment cases and uh, i am a member of that in the university of hyderabad and i tell you that uh, even among the security guards within the educational institutions even among the non teaching staff you know there's lot of uh, um, uh, sexual harassment at workplace against women and we need to sensitize so that is what i've been working on monica okay so what do you cover in the workshop we cover a module which is prepared by senior professors uh, uh, we have uh, you know modules on uh, women studies we have modules on uh, professional and personal uh, balancing professional and uh, uh, you know uh, personal relationships we also have uh, modules on management so we have different modules i have been uh, looking particularly on women studies in women studies uh, the focus the central focus is that more women should come into decision making process because if we look at india uh, the the percentage of women uh, who are at the high positions like vice chancellor or registrar or even as the dean uh, are very minimal yes definitely i you echo that you know, we you, need you, yeah we need more women in decision uh, making position because that's where like you know the voice of women's issue women's uh, uh, would be highlighted right exactly so if you look at manipur university is a central university we haven't have even one lady uh, vice chancellor we haven't had one lady registrar till today in the history of manipur university and let's look at delhi university where you and i study you know we haven't had uh, women at high positions and that's what the uh, you know the 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 thrust of uh, our uh, discussion is that women should come in in the decision making uh, process and that uh, women should also work hard in order but see we cannot just become uh, leaders in academic institution just like that we have to do it through hard work yes and Uh, we have to do project we have to uh, conduct research because without research we cannot just write you know yeah absolutely yeah. yep so we and need to pick up more research projects we have to have publications in very good journals and uh, we need to have uh, that capability to lead as a leader right right so i really love that point right when we talk about uh, gender equality or when we also talk about women to be included in decision making position um we are talking about that but at the same time we are also talking about competence right that we have to work hard to get that so i yeah. love that point also yeah. i know that you have done a lot of uh, you know other research project uh, which includes uh, indian diaspora philanthropy yes. can you touch a little bit on that and also tribes and yes. that's what i was like when i was preparing for your interview i was like wow like you know there are so many things you have done and we have so less time to talk about <laughs> <laughs> yeah so talking of indian diaspora i was a part of this parvasi bharatiya divas when the prime minister um, uh, um you know announce uh, that uh, there will be a kind of uh, gathering for the indian diaspora group uh, vaspai uh, at during vaspai's time uh, they formed this parvasi bharatiya divas where all the indian diaspora across the globe are invited in the month of january to come to india uh, now in uh, 
think 2000 uh, if I remember clearly, they had it in uh, International Convention Center in Hyderabad. And I happened, uh, the University of Hyderabad has a center for Indian diaspora. So Professor Chandrasekhar Bhatt uh, is the founder now, Dr. Ajay Sahu uh, is the only faculty. And uh, uh, they have asked me to, Professor Chandrasekhar Bhatt has asked me to uh, join, uh, you know, um, there as a repetitor. So I joined as a repetitor for Tamil Nadu diaspora, Tamil diaspora. And uh, Monica, I found that during uh, the diaspora Parvasi Bharati Divas, there are thousands of Indians who come from all over the world. And uh, what, of course, the critics uh, pointed out that what India looks for from diaspora is only funding. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, it's not only funding alone. There are many other factors and I don't have time to explain in detail here. But what uh, what touched me during that conference was that, um, you know, how 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 can I uh, uh, how can I study people from the northeast who have migrated uh, overseas? And also, how can I uh, look at uh, Indians who have been, uh, you know, contributing for their villages uh, to develop? See, there are cases in Andhra Pradesh as well as in uh, Gujarat and uh, particularly in Punjab where the diaspora who do well financially abroad come back to their own village and develop their village. They set up hospitals, they set up schools, they even make uh, parks and you know beautify the place and uh, not only healthcare and education, but they also try to bring the holistic development for their own village, you know, Monica. So I wanted to look at this philanthropies and therefore uh, I went to the United States and uh, did um, uh, interviewed, uh, I think around 36 philanthropists and it's amazing to see and one of the interesting finding that uh, came up of this is uh, one of the Indian origin who is actually settled uh, for two generations in uh, South Africa and now lives in the US says that uh, you know when they give back for philanthropy in Hinduism it's called dhan when they give back for philanthropy he feels that um, the rest of his money, he give 10% or 5% for philanthropy, the rest of his money is sanctified. And that is uh, something that I find it very interesting. I, although I don't agree with him. In this <laughs> interesting concept. Yeah. <laughs> but there are many people, uh, Monica, who, um, uh, who are genuinely interested in, um, you know, bringing about bringing about change, uh, change a holistic a holistic change, you know, yes. uh, providing education, setting up schools, setting up a healthcare system in villages. For example, uh, I can give you um, names of two organizations which have been uh, affiliated to since the past uh, almost. Uh, uh, six, seven years now. Uh, one is Segal Foundation, which is earlier called as Segal Family Foundation, run by Dr. Suri Segal from Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, they, they, their office is based in Gurgaon, and uh, they have adopted uh, Muslim villages uh, around Merit, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they, they provide drinking water to this village. They adopted this entire village, so you can imagine. Um, they also focus on agriculture, farmers, they focus on providing free education to children and many more. And another uh, organization is I Foundation America from West Virginia, Morgantown, uh, Dr. Raju, VK Raju. Uh, he has uh, set up his own eye hospital here in Rajamundri in Andhra Pradesh called Gautami Eye Institute. Uh, I'm inspired by these organizations, you know, doing charity and philanthropic work. Uh, one of the young men uh, from a very, very poor family, um, I think he must be less than a year when he came to Dr. V.K. Raju, who's an ophthalmologist with 26 gold medals. 
uh, this boy's parents brought this little boy to him. Uh, I think uh, probably in the late 70s or early 80s. I think is is in the 80s, and the boy has a problem with his cornea, but they're extremely poor. And during that time, it seems they don't have a machine here, equipment to operate on the child. So Dr. V K Raju arranged everything for the boy uh, to come to U.S. And the boy was operated. Today, he runs a pharmaceutical industry as a CEO, and he's a millionaire, and he donates to I Foundation of America. I mean, just imagine, I mean, from an extremely poor family, somebody in Indian diaspora who's a philanthropist have helped and changed his life upside down. Today, he's married and settled there in the US. Well. Um, when I started my work on Indian diaspora, I thought that uh, particularly focusing on philanthropy, I, I thought that, you know, I will find a lot of people who are philanthropists, but no, Monica, hmm. not that. See, people, if, even if we look at NAMA, North America uh, Manipur Association, there are people who give, but they give through NAMA to the organization. And NAMA gives back for the flood and for COVID to a homeland in Manipur or to the US. And similarly, even for Telugu's, you know, um, uh, Telugu diaspora of North America and so is other regional. There are people who gives, maybe it may be $20 or $10 or $50 or $100 or $200, but they, they sometimes give to the organizations. And through the organization, the money is uh, remitted to the home, home homeland. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I find that uh, there are not many people. There are few people who gives directly and who runs the NGO or who gives directly to the home NGO mm -hmm. here in India. You know, so when we, look at, uh, when we look at remittances, actually in India, remittances, when uh, it's sent from abroad to India, it, it is under the radar of the government. Mm. So RBI uh, will have it. Uh, will have the details. Reserve Bank of India will have the details. And uh, also, uh, you know, the Ministry of uh, the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will have the details. But there are uh, people who give uh, through family, through religious institutions, uh, through personal networks. So those are not uh, counted officially. Mm. You know, so remittances comes through even for Manipur diaspora. There are people who give directly to people back in your homeland in Manipur, directly through personal networks, through mm -hmm. friends, yep. not necessarily uh, under the radar of the government. You know? Yes. Yeah. So these are some of my findings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sh sharing. Right. Also being highlighted that when somebody goes out of their hometown, how they are still being connected to their hometown in initiatives and in work. So thank you. So uh, I do want to move to the next segment um, of Thagacheri, that gratitude project, which um, yeah. I have been leading on and definitely yeah. would love to hear your nominations of gratitude in your personal space at the level of Manipur and at the global level. Yeah, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, nominate uh, Dr. Jeremiah Parmai. He's a brother of uh, Armstrong Parmai, who is an IS officer. Dr. Uh, Jeremiah Parmai has been doing excellent work for his people in Manipur. And uh, even uh, in the past, he has helped, you know, he's, he, he is the brain behind, along with his brother Armstrong, to construct that uh, road in Tamanglong district, which even the NAMA, North American uh, uh, Manipur Association, has also contributed financially. And so is so thousands of other individuals. He even, I heard he even set up a hospital. And uh, not only that, uh, this time during the COVID pandemic, he has uh, managed. He managed to, you know, pull in uh, um, funding from friends. He himself has put his own resources to bring back a lot of migrant workers from Manipur, uh, from different parts of India to Manipur, and uh, many other work he's been doing. So I would like to nominate him for his good work. 
Yeah, and here is the picture of uh, Jeremiah Palme. Uh, big thagachari to him for his contribution. And I love, you know, always to hear a new name. And uh, today, you know, I, I have definitely like followed his work and I'm absolutely thrilled that today we have him nominated in our show. Yeah. All right. And I must uh, say that your uh, Finding My Voices, Monica, has been an inspiring one, uh, especially for me. I find it very soothing, calming, and also a lot of uh, knowledge is gained by listening to your talk show and learned. Recently, you spoke uh, to this person from Caesar Hospital, the founder of Caesar Hospital, um, uh, and also uh, many other personalities have come, even youngsters or college goyers you know so uh, you 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 i feel that your heart is in manipur although you are in the us <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you, uh, you may be uh, you know you may be uh, in in your thinking i'm sure you must have americanized to a certain extent but your heart is still for sanali bak <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I really appreciate you for connecting to all groups of people, you know, through the generations, uh, the youth, as well as the older generations, because we need the wisdom and the knowledge passed down from the older generation and also the techno savvy, smart uh, X generation of the 21st century, uh, you know, uh, is also required. So you have all uh, groups of people from all the generations in your show. So it's been a great blessing to not only the people of Manipur, but to many people around the world. And I wish you all the best to climb higher and higher in your talk show. Ah, that's so sweet. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I grew up with lack of freedom not only the freedom of moving around within Manipur, but the lack of voice, right, of expression, um, because we were never encouraged to speak out what we think, what we want. Um, and so I want this platform to be a platform for the youth, right, mm -hmm. also for them to come up and speak and yeah. share their thoughts, right? Like one of the... Um, one of the show we had uh, recently was about a young boy where he was struggling on uh, choosing his career path uh, based on what he's inspired or following what his parents want, right? So yeah. I think yeah. bringing up such topic and having a very uh, productive um, uh, discussion is helpful, not only for the youth, but also yes. for the parents' community because the parents, I think, with very good intention, with what they know, they are setting limitation, but truly they are limitation. But with the world growing and we can be connected, there are so many other resources that a child, a youth would want to pursue something which is unknown for the parents. And because it is unknown, the parents are not supportive because they don't know, right, what is outcome, what is going to be the future. Yeah. So I have found it very, um, you know, very productive for us to have that communication. And of course, as you have mentioned, right, we need to learn from our elders. Yeah. We need to know about our roots. We need to yeah. know about our history. And it's right. been amazing every time I have a guest we learn so many things and um, it's been truly a blessing. So thank you for that kind word. Yeah, All right. So, me. yeah, I want to pick up uh, the comments. Uh, sure. All right. So um, we have Loitong Bum Ibungo Macha saying, watching from Sega Lambi Imphal. Thank you. Uh, we have the song we Nui Mai watching us Kaisam Babita uh, Kaisam Pradip Kumar says glad to hear about child and human trafficking issues yeah he's one of the voices <laughs> the grassroots level thank you Pradip Kumar Kaisam Ningthaujam Yaikomba Singh says Manipur government also need 
to take step. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, but what I'm hearing is, you know, you had escalated and you have already presented to the chief minister and... Yes, uh, I did. But was there any action taken after... Yeah, I heard, I heard uh, that uh, the chief minister has taken it up. My friend has informed me. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I think all of us agree that, you know, we have such a dynamic uh, chief minister who has been... Yes. Uh, very connective with the people of Manipur and very transparent. And, you know, now I find it so easy for me to just follow his page and his uh, social media account to know what's happening. <laughs> so yeah. absolutely, yeah. Uh, Rosorika Angom says, how old are these children? And can you also please share how they got trapped? Are their parents not at all aware or by any chance parents or near relative involved in all this yeah i think i've already as i said earlier the children are as young as uh, uh, five years old onwards and uh, they were trapped because of the local agent who speak their own dialect who are from their own community uh, who promised them falsely uh, deceive them that they will be given free education with boarding facility and the parents are trusting parents you know very simple minded trusting parents so they easily get trapped and um, uh, i would say relatives perhaps some far off relatives are also the agent but uh, i don't want to criticize any of those because um, Certain in in uh, you know Monica, I used to think that maybe these local agents themselves are deceived by the national and uh, international agents. Also, some of these local agents, some not everybody, uh, perhaps are aware that the children, the the young boys and girls, and even adult women, when they send them outside Manipur, would ended up in brothels for sexual. Yeah or would end up as domestic uh, laborers you know they perhaps uh, some of these agents perhaps doesn't imagine that they are doing this some of them may be aware but some local agent may not be aware as well because they're doing for money they've been paid to recruit right. children you know and mm -hmm. women yeah yeah so i think very i think the biggest takeaway is you know sometimes we have this innate habit of pointing fingers to others that, oh, you know, the children are trafficked in other places of Manipur, right? So we want to put the blame to the other states or other country. But yeah. what we truly have to look inward is the source is people, the agents are there in Manipur, are the local yeah. people talking local dialect. Yes, exactly. So I think when we want to clean up, that's where we need to start. Yeah, things are slowly improving, Monica, today, you know. Uh, the last visit um, uh, to Manipur uh, for me is in 2019, last year. And I must say that, uh, uh, you know, um, parents have now began to alert themselves. I mean, a lot of awareness campaign has been going on. And therefore, uh, many parents are now having a second thought of sending. So that's yeah. a good trend yeah that is good yes okay and a follow-up question and what do you think would be the root cause and solution the government or local people should implement to stop this human trafficking yeah i think the root cause is poverty and also because manipur is infected with insurgency and ethnic conflict you know and also these are the push factors which pushes the people out mm. forces the people out and there's a pull factor this is the economics theory which a lot of sociologists also use the pull factor is the attractive packages from the metro cities like free education jobs 
for young teenage girls who are class 10 plus, class 10 pass or 12 pass or, you know, graduate, uh, offer jobs in different spas or sales executive. You know, usually traffickers will promise them uh, secretarial jobs or good jobs, but when they land it up, they are given the other jobs which are of lower level and then exploit them. So uh, there's a push and pull factor here. And uh, as I said, the root cause is uh, the poverty, unemployment, and also ethnic unrest and insurgency in the past. Uh, and even at present, uh, the, the government, I feel, should uh, set up schools, tighten the school system. Because if Manipur has uh, very good uh, uh, educational institutions, schools and colleges, uh, why should our children go out, Monica? Yes. You and I were also forced out of yes. Manipur after 12 because our parents want us to get the best uh, education, right? Yeah, if get the education, income, get a job without paying money. That was money, one of exactly, our, yeah. Exactly. Like, if Manipur can uh, have a college like Miranda House, Lady Sri Ram College, for example, I'm saying, or IITs, you know, then you and I wouldn't have go out of Manipur for graduation yeah absolutely. even for post graduation so we need the government should focus on providing good educational institutions that was a and, very good uh, answer yeah yes go ahead you want and to add to, to stop human trafficking there should be a massive awareness campaign i feel the impact tv for example tom tv all the local tv channels all the newspapers, Shanghai Express, so you know many other uh, uh, local newspapers, district newspapers, they all should focus on stop human trafficking slogan, because human trafficking is always not for sex. See, people think when we say human trafficking, oh, it's for yeah. sex, for prost. No, sorry, please. The public should understand that it's not for prostitution alone. It's it is not. You know, it is for blood harvesting. It is for organ transplant. It is for domestic labor. It is for exploitation of different forms. So when we talk of human trafficking, it is not always about sex. Sorry, that's not the way we should understand human trafficking. Human trafficking is a business of greed, you know, and it's spread across 127 countries around the world. Even America in the heart of New York, you know, Monica, in the heart of New York City itself, the FBI cannot catch the traffickers. It's that bad. So it's a very serious problem. In Manipur, it's a small state. Therefore, we can control it. We can stop this human trafficking. But there should be a massive awareness um, in all the districts, including the valley. Absolutely. And I think uh, you mentioned one point which we have not spoken about. Trafficking includes organ right yeah. like we have yeah. heard about that and that's yeah. something which is trending up yes and blood that is harvesting. trending up yes exactly and blood harvesting monica they feed the children mm -hmm. you know the children become so healthy then they suck out the blood this is also a new trend of human trafficking. I'm told that in Assam, in some pockets of Assam, it's happening. Although in my recent interview with the uh, CID, the police officials in CID, uh, I couldn't find any of those, uh, you know, cases. But there are already, uh, you know, informations from the social activists that uh, blood harvesting is also coming up. Love elopment, Facebook. Uh, and all the social media are also <laughs> becoming seriously Hasiwa Harvey, yeah. who is a crusader and who has developed this impulse model uh, to prevent human trafficking, has been talking to me um, uh, earlier, have, have mentioned to me earlier uh, that, you know, Facebook and other social media, this uh, cyber world medium is used by the trafficker and love track, love relationship. They fall in love with the girl. They make the girl fall in love with him, the trafficker. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when they meet up, they elopt. Mm -hmm. And in Manipur, elopt is a part of the cultural heritage. So uh, elopt, and then uh, after one, two months, 
send them in the brothel or send them to the massage parlor, send them to wherever, you know, the trafficker wanted to wish to. So uh, social media is today a very, and that's why the uh, cyber police is required to enter, uh, to, to intervene uh, in human trafficking. So we, even if we're able to curb uh, trafficking um, through the old strategy, the new strategy is the cyber world. So therefore we need to be extremely cautious and the Manipur police have to train themselves, uh, I feel, I mean, I'm not an authority to say that, but it's just a suggestion, you know, that they have to be trained in cyber crime very, very well. Yeah, definitely. So I think it's, Let's continue this conversation. You know, when you see news about it, let's take it as a personal responsibility to share it so that we are all aware, right? Because there are a lot of youth in the social media which can be used in a productive way, but also it can be used like in a bad way. And uh, particularly the youth feel so glamorized when somebody at the other end would be uh, leering them, you know, with good words, with promises and then they fall into the trap so we have to be smarter we have to be super smart to identify that to do the due diligence exactly. of background before you jump in into anything be it love i know a lot of teenagers yeah. all of you are watching us so this is a message for you yeah okay so let me quickly pick up the remaining comment and thank you everyone for making the session interactive um, and watching us and joining us, uh, you know, with our conversation. Kaisam Pradip Kumar uh, writes, a state action plan for prevention, at rescue and rehabilitation has been submitted two years back to the state from MACR site, awaiting its implementation. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, he's been working very hard at the grassroots level and also at the policy level. Yeah, and then a comprehensive draft state child policy has been submitted to government from MCPC are still waiting approval. If such policy and action plan are not in place, child and woman trafficking cannot be controlled. Mm. Thank you so much, Pradip Kumar, for sharing that uh, update and thank you for um, your work. Jiten Thomas uh, writes, Ma'am Azailu is working on very important cause. Salute to her. Yes, mm -hmm. I join in the salute. <laughs> Nupur Patanya. Thank you so much, ma'am. Very insightful and in-depth analysis. Very informative. Mm -hmm. My bum, Vaneshwari Devi, this is shocking. And if there is something that we can do as a public, please convey us some message. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I saw a comment that video is not seen, but I do see the video, so I guess it must have been a glitch. Uh, Pamhaiba Rajkumar says, we live in a misogynist and patriarchal society which affects the life of many people. In the name of culture, women are always discriminated from their home itself. What can be done to break the stereo stereotypes? That's a good question. Should I answer, Monica? Uh, and then I want to add one more follow-up question. When do you, when you talk about sensitization, do you include the queer community, the community. too? Yeah. Okay, yes. so I think, yeah, if you can address those questions, that uh, would be awesome. Think, yeah, I think the queer community is also very vulnerable in Manipur. Um, and therefore, uh, we definitely has to uh, include them, obviously, you know. We cannot think of exclusion. Today, we, we should focus only on inclusiveness, right, of the third gender as well. So that includes the queer community. And, um, um, you know, when we talk of uh, patriarchal society and the culture in which women are discriminated, yes, I think if we look at uh, our own society in Manipur, for example, among the Meites, Monica, you know very well, my aunts have been married to the Meite men. They have to take bath before 
in the morning, you know, before cooking, they have, I mean, all those uh, purity, pollution issues, you know, th those also plays uh, a very uh, significant role in terms of making the woman feel inferior. Uh, so I think we need to, uh, today, of course, things are changing, Monica. Uh, <laughs> That's a very good point. I never thought about it. So when a man gets up and make tea, do they have to take bath? Not at all. But... <laughs> That's a question to our viewer. That's yeah. uh, something we need to yeah. ask ourselves. But yes, it's hygienic. It is good. But, you know, when you expect a woman to... Uh, you know that the woman has to take part and then go only in the kitchen then we have to ask okay do men have to do that yeah <laughs> i never and thought about it but thank you for bringing that up yeah in the in the earlier days you know um, there is no shower uh, system in many homes and there is no running hot water um, I remember one of my aunts says that she has to go to Pukri, the local pond, to take bath, as many other women. That's the cultural practices, right, in many of these localities in the 70s and 80s. Of course, today they have running water in many homes. They may be having even geyser, hot water running and all that. Things have changed, but then those days are not. And uh, of course, today in many mid, uh, lower middle, uh, lower, lower middle class and uh, poor income group, they still have to go to the local community pond to take bath. Women have to take bath, I mean. And even in winter, they take bath in cold water before, you know, they have to cook food. So these are uh, cultural systems which made the women feel inferior, I feel. And of course, there are many other things, you know, a umpot, uh, which indirectly is a dowry system, is also making women inferior, you know. People talk how many award, how many uh, material goods the bride brings for the girl, uh, for the boy. I mean, today forget about gold. They say land, houses, uh, car, uh, car. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. not Maruti brand. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. I think sometimes, anymore, so. sometimes we talk and we pride ourselves that, oh, you know, we want to not acknowledge that it's happening in our society, right? It happens, right? It, yeah, it like, happens. It happens. And uh, it is good that we are talking about it um, yeah. because people I have seen, right, that, oh, no, it doesn't, you know, we don't have like, okay, it's different word, right? Of course, Awunpod was supposed to be meant for a uh, gift, uh, but, yeah. you know, we have seen that, you know, it being misused or, uh, miscategorize um, and so we have to acknowledge that the intent was not as a dowry dowry system uh, but it has been misused and you see yeah. that like the society uh, feels pressured right that oh we have to give this 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 and there is like a big list yeah it's things to be done you know, it's commercialization of a girl, of a bride. Uh, so you're selling your yourself. If a girl insists on taking dowry, she's a, she's selling herself. If uh, her parents are doing it, her parents are commercializing their daughter. So we have to say no to it. You know, um, we have to say, I'm a woman. I've come as a bride to the house. You should be glad that I'm a wife. I'm a bride of the house. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah. We can bring little thing as a courtesy. You know, but uh, we cannot uh, promote this kind of culture to the extent uh, how how many car, how many land, how many home ports we bring, right? And another thing is Monica, the preference for boys over girls. Oh yes, this is. I mean, you know, I think we need another session for it. Um, yeah. You know, we need to talk about this because, trust me, in Manipur, people pride ourselves saying that oh no 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 it is another part of india we love our children no you no. know in your immediate circle yes. when a lady does not have a boy child you have yeah. seen situation where that men would get married again, again in the hope yeah. of getting a boy child yes. so please like i mean to our listeners like you can give your comment but i have seen this so don't yeah. say that it's not happening in our society it is happening yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all right so i think this is a very good conversation let's continue having this conversation and i want to um you know end by picking the last uh, comment from rosarika angom yeah. get job 
um, without paying bribe is the very reason for many of us to leave our homeland and go out for higher studies and career. And completely agree, uh, a one pot is a kind of dowry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. So thank you everyone for such an engaging conversation. Your participation and comments are awesome. And thank you, Zailu, so much for all the work you are doing. Um, it has been, you know, I can't imagine the amount of effort, the amount of interview, the amount of research you did to highlight what is happening in our state. I'm so proud of your work and I am sure that, you know, we are going to collaborate and work on more projects together and I'll be happy to uh, be a source of platform for any of your findings and research work because this is what we need to learn together. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Monica, for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to know you better and also to connect to the people through your media, to, through your talk show. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting yeah. me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, bye. Yeah, bye-bye.